So, let me also, in order to give another perspective of this mechanism, let me also describe this mechanism in terms of band structure. You've already seen bands. You see, we are we are doing increasing levels of complication and increasing levels of sophistication in our argument here. So, you, but you need to pay attention for that and stop talking. So, if I have, <coughs> say, before the junction is formed, what kind of band structure do I have? Before the junction is formed, I have an n-type material and a p-type material. There's a connection valence band and a conduction band. And in n type material, at zero kelvins, there are no charge carriers whatsoever. If this were a pure semiconductor, the connection band will be completely filled, the valence band, sorry, will be completely filled, and the conduction band will be empty. Right? This is what happens in a pure semiconductor. Neither end nor end in an, in an intrinsic semiconductor at zero kelvins. Now, if I dope this with a p-type material, with an n-type material like for, like a phosphorus atom or a nitrogen atom, these are pentavalent atoms. These are elements of of group five, so they have five electrons. Four of them bond with neighboring silicon atoms, and the fifth one becomes a mobile electron. Now. How will the energy structure change, energy band diagram change for an n-type material with respect to an intrinsic material? With an intrinsic material, we have a completely filled valence band and a completely empty conduction band at zero kelvins. Now, if I have an n-type material at zero kelvins, can you guess what the energy level structure is going to look like? I have put in some extra atoms, some dopants some n-type atoms into this crystal. What is, how is it going to change the energy level structure of the energy band diagram? Still at zero kelvins. Yes? There will be a new band below, N, below the conduction band. So this is my conduction band. This is my valence band. There will be a new level below the conduction There will be a? A new level. With Have you read about this before? All right, you've read about this before. Well, <laughs> nevertheless, really good. What happens is a new level is formed here. Now, it's not a whole band because the number of dopant elements is really small. And bands are formed when the number of atoms is really large. Now, this is only one nitrogen or phosphorus atom for every million silicon atoms. So, it's a really small concentration of dopants. So that's why this, uh, not a new band is formed, but only a few levels are formed, one or two levels are formed. And this level has electrons in it. Remember, I'm drawing the picture at zero kelvins. If I go slightly above zero kelvins, now this gap is really small. Since this gap is really small, because this level is just below the conduction band, this gap is really small, so these electrons can be easily promoted to the conduction band. And they become mobile charge carriers. And these are the mobile electrons that I've drawn in these diagrams over here. These electrons are supplied by the nitrogen or the phosphorus impurity atoms. These are the coming, these are derived from the dopants. Okay? So now if I have this picture over here, and I would like to find out the average energy of the charge carriers here. If this were a pure semiconductor, if I had a pure or an intrinsic semiconductor, connection band, valence band, completely filled, electrons and empty connection band at zero Kelvin. So the probability of occupancy of the valence band is one, 100 percent probability here. And here the probability is zero. Electrons have energies up to this level here. So if I were to ask you what's the average energy of this system, 
what would be the average energy? This is some energy E1. This is some energy E2. The top of the valence band is at energy E1. The bottom of the conduction band is at energy E2. What's the average energy in this case? E1. E1 plus E2 over 0. Oh, over 2. <laughs> so the average of these energies. So that gives me an gives me some datum level. Datum level means reference level, like an equation. <coughs> it's like a fictitious fiducial line. It's, it's a datum, it's a reference. <coughs> this is also called the Fermi level. One definition of the Fermi level is that it's the maximum field energy level. The other definition is that the, it represents the average energy level. Technically, this is called the chemical potential, but let's call it the Fermi level at zero Kelvin. Now, if I look at this n-type material, where does the Fermi level lie compared to this pure semiconductor? It lies higher. It actually lies very close to this <coughs> level. This level is called the uh, donor level. Okay, it's like it's called the donor level. This level that is formed inside an n-type material. So the Fermi level actually lies really, 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 really close to the donor level. Because the average of a field valence band and a conduction band is, empty conduction band is in the middle. So all the energy is actually coming from these electrons. So you have to go above the middle of this gap. And the Fermi level is actually going to be really close to this, to this level. So this is the Fermi level in an n-type material. Now you're doing something really sophisticated here, by the way. And not many electrical engineers, which most of you are likely to become, will understand this. But it's important, it's essential to understand what's going on here from a fundamental physics perspective. That will help you design new devices. You don't just want to be a practitioner of engineering and use a manual and, and just make circuits work. You have to design as well. So you need to understand what are the ingredients, what are the rudiments, what's, what is this made up of? So this is the energy band structure of an n-type material on its own. Now I would like to draw the energy band structure of a p-type material on its own, not mated with the n-type material and a junction has not yet been formed. So now I have a p-type material. In a p-type material, what I do have at zero Kelvin, at zero Kelvin I always have a completely filled valence band. And now in a p-type material I need holes. So where are those holes coming from? Those holes are coming from some impurity atoms. Some impurity atoms are grafted, are locked into the lattice. They substitute some silicon atoms. They're not impurities, they're not at the interstitial locations. They replace some of the silicon atoms and sit in their place. But they have only three electrons. They are, they don't have the full regimen of four electrons to bond with. So there's a hole created inside the valence band, not in the conduction band. But at zero kelvins, just analogous to this process, a level is formed just close to the valence band because you like to have holes inside the valence band. So what happens is that inside the valence band, you have holes living inside the valence band. Now these are pictures, these are conceptual illustrations of what's going on. These are called band structure diagrams. Now if you raise the temperature a little bit, some of the electrons inside the valence band will be promoted to this acceptor level here. This is the acceptor level. And this is a really small gap. So these electrons will be easily promoted to the acceptor level. And when they are promoted to the acceptor level, holes will be created inside the valence band. And that's what you have in a P-type field. You have holes inside the valence band. Yeah, bar bar isko sunenge, bar bar isko sunenge. I'm talking slowly, but when you listen to it, bar bar isko sunenge, bar bar isko sunenge, aram se, tasalli se, to aapko samaj aage ki. You have a, an acceptor level formed slightly above the valence band, which has holes in it, or which is empty. Holes means it's an empty acceptor level. Now, an electron at the tip of the valence band can be easily promoted to the acceptor level because this is a 
that really small gap. If this gap is of the order of one electron volt, this gap will be of the order of a milli electron volt. It's a really small gap. So electrons from the top of the valence band can be easily promoted to the acceptor level. These acceptor levels are derived from the acceptor atoms, from the impurity atoms. When electrons are promoted, it creates holes in their wake inside the valence band. So, and these can also be created by temperature, and right? so these are created by temperature. So you get both inside the p-type material. And the Fermi level of this structure, since there's an absence of electrons, the absence of electrons is what it brings down the energy of electrons down, because electrons have now disappeared from the system. The Fermi energy represents the average energy of the electrons. Now you are taking away electrons from the system. You are removing electrons, so the energy must come down. If you have fewer electrons, more holes, the energy must come down. From the perspective of electrons, if electrons are your reference for energy, so the Fermi level for the holes in the p-type material, the Fermi level for, is actually right next to the acceptor level. So this is the Fermi level with reference to the electrons inside the p-type material. And you always talk about Fermi levels with respect to the electrons. Also remember that for electrons, more electrons in the n-type material means higher energy. For a p-type material, more holes in deeper down into the valence band means higher energy. <coughs> OK? So now, when I put these p and n-type materials together and make a diode, Equilibrium must be maintained. And equilibrium ma means that in the p-type region and in the n-type region, the average energies must be the same. If I'm exchanging energy with you, I'm at a higher energy level, I'm going to give you energy. And this process is going to cease when our energies become equal. When heat flows from a hot object to a cold object, and the process equilibrium is maintained when the internal energies or the thermal energies, the average energy of the two systems becomes the same. So equilibrium is going to be established, which means that I will have this scenario here. In the absence of a battery, I will get this scenario, this junction developed, when the Fermi levels are going to be the same inside the two regions. So when I make this into a crystal and a junction is established, this entire structure has to come down, and this entire structure has to go up so that the two Fermi levels in the two regions becomes the same. So the average energies become the same, equilibrium is established, and let's see what the new band structure is going to look like when equilibrium has been established and a junction has been made. is that I will have a scenario of this kind.
Now, let me describe this. This is the n-type material. This is the p-type material. Electrons in the n-type material are diffusing into the p-type material across the junction. And when they diffuse, this entire band structure goes up, which means that this Fermi level is going up because now there are more energetic electrons inside the p-type which in this Fermi level has to go up. And when this Fermi level goes up, since now electrons have been donated by the n-type region, they have moved out from the n-type region because these are energetic electrons, this Fermi level is lowered. And equilibrium is going to be established when the two Fermi levels become equal. All right? So these are the Fermi levels inside the n-type region. It becomes equal to the Fermi level inside the p-type region. And this is when equilibrium has been established and the junction voltage has now been created. Likewise, holes inside this region, they, there are holes here. They will move into the n-type region create some holes here. So they are going to move into the n-type region, they are going to create some holes. When holes have moved out, the energy goes up because the moving out of electrons is, is akin to the coming in of electrons. Holes going out is the same as electrons coming in. So the energy is going up. So both of these processes have the same effect. This Fermi level goes down, this Fermi level goes up, and at a certain point, equilibrium ha has been established. Now, when this state of equilibrium has been established, the further flow of electrons from the n-type material to the p-type material is not allowed because these electrons have to go uphill. So these electrons have to go uphill. They can't go uphill. And these poles also have to go uphill. Remember that for electrons, positive energy, increasing energy is in the upward direction. So these electrons have to go uphill and for holes, increasing uphill energies are in the downward direction. So these holes also have to go uphill. If you would like to re-establish conduction, you need, what you need to do is you need to raise this Fermi level up again. And you have to lower this Fermi level up again. And in order to increase the Fermi level, you connect the end type to and n type, the n terminal of the battery, because the n terminal of the battery will supply electrons, more energetic electrons will come in, and this Fermi level will go up again, and this Fermi level will go down. And this junction board, this, so in a forward bias condition, what the picture is going to look like is the following. This is what the picture is going to look like. This is EFN, EFP. The Fermi level inside the n-type region has gone up, and the Fermi level inside the p-type region has gone down. And electrons, overall, you can just look at the Fermi levels and look at the flow of electrons. Since the Fermi level of the electrons is higher in the n-type material, electrons in general will go from this side of the junction towards this side because the average energy of the electrons is higher. You can just look at the Fermi levels and forget about the valence and the conduction bands and just it, conceptually you can see that whenever the Fermi level of the electrons is higher in one region, electrons are going to flow. Here the Fermi level of the electrons were higher before the junction was formed, so electrons flowed from the higher Fermi level to the lower Fermi level until equilibrium was established and the two Fermi levels became the same. Now remember that this is not a real level. The Fermi level is not a real level. It's just an average energy. It's just a fictitious energy. It's not a real level. There are no electrons actually here at the Fermi level because this is inside a gap. In the reverse bias condition, what's going to happen is that this Fermi level is going to be lowered and this Fermi level is going to be raised. So in a reverse bias condition, this junction, this depletion region, is the, the electric field inside is going to become more steeper. The slope of the sign is actually the electric field, but these are technical details. So what's going to happen in the reverse bias condition is the following.
the Fermi level inside the electron, inside the n-type region, is much smaller than the Fermi level inside the p-type region, and electrons will make, find it impossible to actually go from this region to this region, and no conduction can take place. However, some minority charge carriers inside the p-type region, the minority charge carriers are electrons inside the p-type region, will find it downhill to move towards the n-type material. And these, in the reverse bias condition, these minority charge carriers will contribute to the flow of a small, small leakage current. So you can also describe this conduction mechanism from the circuit perspective, from the diffusion perspective, the movement of charge carriers, and also from the perspective of band structure. All of these are equivalent descriptions. Yes. So when you reverse bias this material here, you apply positive potential here. So electron, the energy of the electron is lowered. When the electron see a positive terminal of the battery, the energy is lowered because the electrons like the positive terminal of the battery. So since it like the positive terminal of the battery, all of the energies here have to come down. This is connected with the negative terminal of the battery, and the holes which are the majority carriers here are now see the, the negative terminal of the battery, they like that scenario. Okay? So their energy has to go down as well. Energies for the holes going down means that the band structure is actually going up. So the energy for the holes going down means that the energy for the electrons inside this region, which is the reference for the Fermi level, is going up. So in the p-type material, the entire band shifts upward. In the n-type material, the entire band shifts downwards. And the gradient, it becomes more uphill for the majority charge carriers inside the n-type material to flow into the p-type material, and no conduction takes place. However, some minority charge carriers will find it easy, and they will cascade down like a waterfall from the p-type to the n-type material. But these are only minute amount of charge carriers. OK? That's what's happening. Now I would like to, if you apply, let's Mechanics, and I'm going to connect all of this with band structure as well in the next week. If I have an object and I apply a force to an object, it's going to accelerate, right? So the center of mass of that object, excuse me, of this class.
But in order to motivate this, let me show you an animation. So if you look at this video here, nothing special about this video. I'm just taking a table tennis ball and bouncing it off the ground. It's nothing interesting about it. <laughs> Let me replay this. another video, a variant of the video that I've shown. Now, in all phenomenon that you observe, the tenets of physics need to be satisfied. Tenets are the principles. The basic principles of physics need to be satisfied. And there are some basic principles of physics, which, such as the conservation of energy, has to be satisfied. Uh, the process has to be symmetric. If I am observing something and someone is flying on a plane and observing the same event, both our descriptions must tally. Somehow they must tally. All right? If I run time backwards, no, now let's see, now let me run another process here. Related to the video that I've shown you. Let me replay the video, by the way. I'm not hiding any details here, but this is just an innocuous, simple, innocent looking video. Nothing special about it. All right. Now, let's look at this video. And suppose you were a true being and you were actually observing this. Now, let me replay this. Do you actually observe this behavior? But the question is, does this behavior violate some principle of physics? What principle of physics does it violate? Elastic collisions. All right, let me show you another thing. There's the conservation of energy. You discover new particles by having beams of particles beaming into one another, electrons and protons coming into one another, or beams of protons coming into one another, they collide with one another and they create a giant cornucopia of new particles. And you discover those new particles. You look at their properties, their momentums, their charges, their masses, their parities, and their spins. You detect those new particles. That's how you discovered the Higgs boson three or four years ago. So what, what does this experiment look like? This is what the experiment looks like. <coughs> so this is a simulation. I have beams of particles coming in, shown in blue, and they collide with one another, and they create this plethora of new particles zooming out in all different directions, a large number of them. This is a huge encyclopedia of new particles, a zoo of particles that is created from just two orderly beams that are coming in and colliding with one another at energies of seven tera electron volts each. And then you look at the properties of these new particles and find signatures of new theories that you've already predicted. You find signatures of particles that match that theory and then lo and behold you've discovered a new particle, Eureka. But now let's look at this, at the same now, energy has to be conserved in this process. Momentum has to be conserved in this process. These are basic tenets of physics that cannot be violated if you live in the same world. Now, let me replay this video. But if energy is always conserved and the momentum is always conserved, why don't you see a process like this? 
Hey, come on, you, you can't, why don't you come and teach? You're exactly correct, but can you explain this? Naturally. Can you explain? You're a physicist, you're not a naturalist. So why doesn't this inverse process happen? Heat flows from a hot to a cold object. Energy is conserved. Why doesn't heat flow from a cold to a hot object? Energy is conserved in that process as well. So what's happening here? We have to resort to a new fundamental principle of physics, which is a sign of your scientific literacy. And that's the concept of entropy. It's one of the most difficult concepts in physics. And almost everyone gets it wrong, gets it wrong. Because it's a tricky concept. Okay? I would like to describe this concept in some detail now. We keep, keep in mind these videos that I've shown. And this is understanding what entropy is all about. Okay? And it's a very deep concept. Now, my question is, related to the videos, I have a hot object. Hot object at some temperature, 300 degrees C or 300 kelvins. And I have a cold object, 100 K. Now when there is some channel of heat transfer between these objects, there's no vacuum in between, or even if there's vacuum, there's some radiative transfer, there's some channel by which energy can transfer from the hot to the cold, or the possibility of energy transfer from the cold to the hot. Equilibrium will eventually be established. And in a state of equilibrium, everything will be at the same energy. And the overall energy of the system is not changing. All of this is in a closed environment. So this is a closed system. So the overall energy of the system is not going to change. There could be interchange of energy between the parts inside the closed system, the interconnected parts, but the overall energy of the system is not going to change because it's a closed system. So now, we all know that temperature is the random thermal motion of atoms inside a solid. So what, what you argue is that energetic electrons, energetic atoms here, they are going to collide with the less energetic atoms inside the cold object and they're going to transfer their energy here. So these will become cooler, these will become warmer eventually when both of the hot and the cold systems are at the same energy, energy transfer is going to cease. 
and a state of dynamic equilibrium is going to be established. But it's also possible that the really hot atoms inside the gold, the really energetic atoms inside the gold body, there's going to be a distribution of velocities, the really hot atoms inside the gold object, they can also transfer their energies to the cooler of atoms inside the hot material. Right? So why can't energy transfer in the other direction? And thermodynamics is actually the answer. And statistical mechanics is actually the answer to this. Now, statistical mechanics, the central con one of the central concepts, ideas of statistical mechanics is this object called S. Now, S is, you can consider this, this is a symbol for entropy, one of the least understood concepts in physics. And that's why I put the most emphasis on it. A biologist should know what entropy is. Chemists should know what entropy is. This S actually stands for the spreading of energy. Now, this looks like slippery ground already because you're trying to become a physicist, you're trying to be, be proper and formal, and you're using such an improper word, spreading. <laughs> spreading of energy. This is so improper, and the connotation of the word spreading of it doesn't look very scientific. But let me explain what this is about. Yes? But thermal equilibrium does not mean that all the particles inside the gold object are at the same energy. There is thermal equilibrium means what does thermal equilibrium mean? That's a very good question. Really good question. Thermal equilibrium means that energy is the speed. So I have half mv square is the speed of a particle. This is the energy of a particle. Okay? Now I have an ensemble of atoms inside the hot or the cold object. All of them will have different speeds. It's not that because this, this is now being treated like a classical gas here. All the atoms are moving with different speeds. However, if I plot the speed here, V, and here I plot the probability, the probability density in a way, that is the probability that I find out an atom with speed V, all of them will not have the same speed. Sorry, I'm sorry. The distribution will not look like this. It's not a Dirac delta function at some speed V, which is given by 2 E over M under root. This is not true. According to Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, there's a distribution of speeds. This comes from the kinetic theory of gases. That distribution of speeds is going to look like this. which is this number here. This is the modal speed. This is the most likely, if you pick up an atom inside this gas, it's most likely that it will have this speed. But there's an entire range of distribution of speeds. Okay? And thermal equilibrium means that this graph does not change. It does not mean that there's a drag delta function and all the atoms have the same speed. If the temperature changes, a new state of thermal equilibrium is, is established. So if the temperature goes up, the new distribution of speed will go like this. The modal distribution, the modal speed will go up, the average speed is going to go up, the root mean square speed is going to go up. And equilibrium means that a new distribution has now been formed. Okay? So this is what thermal equilibrium means, but by no means does it mean that all the atoms have the same speed. That's a very good question. I like this question. Now I would like to talk about entropy. Now this is a really nice concept. And let me introduce entropy in a systematic fashion. 
Suppose I have an atom. That atom is a part of a solid. In statistical mechanics, you're not dealing with one atom, you're dealing with a large collection of atoms. This could be one atom, it could be two atoms, it could be a thousand atoms, it could be a million, billion, trillion, zillion atoms, lots of atoms. That's why it's called statistical mechanics. And, but let me, since we've done quantum mechanics, so we're taking the root of using the power of quantum mechanics to describe the statistical mechanics. Let me take a single atom. But if you look at a, at a solid, a solid is composed of atoms connected to neighboring atoms locked together in a three-dimensional network. And the bonds between atoms, they can be modeled by springs with different spring constants. So it's a three-dimensional network and so on. So it's a three-dimensional network. It's called a statistical solid or an Einsteinian solid. So if I just zoom in on one atom, and I would like to model the behavior of that atom. <coughs> I can model the behavior of a single atom by a harmonic oscillator, like a pendulum, like a mass attached to a spring. But the only thing is that there are three degrees of freedom. The atom will move in the x direction, y direction, or z direction, because it's a three-dimensional solid. I'm not talking about graphene, which is a two-dimensional solid. It's a three-dimensional solid. So a single atom can just, for modeling purposes, or for motivating statistical mechanics can be modeled as it can either have an x motion or it can have a, a z motion or it can have a y motion. So this is now coming towards you outwards. x motion, y motion, and z motion. And the energy of this atom could be a combination of, you can separate out the x motion from the y motion from the z motion. They are independent. Okay, if the amplitude of oscillation remains same, then these become independent oscillators. So one atom can be represented by three harmonic oscillators. And the energy of this atom is going to be a combination of half, k, x, one squared, plus half m v x squared kinetic energy plus potential energy along the x direction plus half k x or y k y squared let's call it x k y squared plus half m v y squared plus half k z squared plus half m v z squared. So this single atom is modeled by three harmonic oscillators, independent. And the total energy of this atom is the sum of the three harmonic oscillators, one along x, one along y, one along z. Okay? Now, the nice, what I'm assuming here is that in all the three directions, the k is the same. Right? Now, what kind of solid would this be if k is the same in all the three directions? Circular solid. Yeah, getting close. What kind of solid is it? It's cubic is close, but it's an isotropic solid. Isotropic solid means the properties don't depend upon the direction. It's it has a cubic crystal structure, in other words. Uh, not exactly, but cubics are, cubics are generally isotropic. So its properties don't depend upon the direction. So a bond along the x direction has the same strength as a bond along the y direction. So the material is the same in all directions. It's isotropic. This is the assumption here. Now quantum mechanically, each one of these degrees of freedom is quantized. The energy is quantized along each direction. So I can also, from a quantum mechanical perspective, this atom can be represented by three harmonic oscillators. This is just one atom 
three oscillators, three oscillators standing up for one atom. One along the X, one along the Y, and one along the Z. And each one of these oscillators has, since it's a harmonic oscillator, I'm assuming that the amplitude are small, that's where I can use this approximation, all the energy levels are equally spaced. And the spacing in all the levels, in all the three directions is the same, because it's an isotropic solid. And the energy levels go up to infinity. Now this is why we have studied quantum mechanics before studying classical mechanics, because it's easier to motivate statistical mechanics. Other people would do it the other way around. But for me, quantum mechanics is the supreme. So now, with this understanding of quantum mechanics, we have three harmonic oscillators standing up for one atom. Now, the energy is quantized. If this atom has some energy, where is that energy? Suppose the atom has units of four energy, four quanta. So its energy is four units. This is the ground state here. In each one, this is the ground state, E0. And since this is a large solid, E0 is almost the same as zero. It's not exactly zero, it can't be zero because of the zero point energy. But it's a large solid, so this energy, ground state energy is very close to zero. Why am I saying that? Large solid, why is this energy close to zero? Which principle, which tenet of physics does apply here? Yes? Ma no. Any, any more ideas? Kya bolya? The confinement principle. You squeeze objects, the energies go down. If the object is large, this all the energies go down. The uncertainty principle. So the zero point energy is proportional to one over L squared, if you remember, in a one dimension. So L goes up, the ground state energy goes down. So this energy is really small. So if I give some energy to this atom, suppose I give it an energy of four units. So this energy is zero unit, one unit, two unit, three unit, four unit. Right? So I'm just using these units now. I call these units quanta. I give this atom for quanta of energy. Now, how will energy spread or distribute itself within this atom? In which degree of freedom? There are multiple ways. Now, in the next class, I would like to come up with all the... One possibility is that all the energy is in the x direction. And it has four quanta inside this oscillator. One possibility is that this is empty and there are four quanta in here. One possibility is that this is empty, there are four quanta in here. But there are other possibilities as well. So I would like you to draw all the possibilities and that's where we will start off our next lecture from. I'm going to discuss the second law of thermodynamics. Thank you and you're going to have a quiz on Saturday.